Hi everyone, welcome to chapter two, the chemical level of organization in Bio 205. Things are moving along at a pretty good clip at this point, and I hope you're feeling like you have your feet underneath you, because this is the point at which everything starts to pick up speed and everything starts building upon itself. So buckle in, get ready. This is a really basic chapter. You've probably taken a lot of this in high school before, so it should be mostly a refresher although it's probably not stuff that you've thought of since high school, so it might feel new. But nonetheless, we'll get through it, and after we've gone through several chapters of this very basic information, then we're going to move on into the much more complicated stuff that feels more like anatomy and physiology. But without the chemical level here, we really can't move on to anything more complicated. So let's get started. In every lecture, I'm going to start off by giving you the objectives for the day so that way you know what you can be expected to be tested upon and how to study accordingly. So please take these objectives as your study notes, basically. You'll also see that all of the objectives for Unit 1, which is chapters 1, 2, and 3 from your big anatomy and physiology text, the Fundamentals of Anatomy and Physiology, it's all posted under FAQ slash information on our Blackboard site if you want it all in one quick printable Word document. So first, you're going to be able to define the following terms, including matter, mass, an atom, and an element. You'll be able to describe atomic structure, including protons, neutrons, and electrons, as well as electron shell interactions to form molecules and compounds. You'll be able to explain atomic number and atomic mass to calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons that are present within an element. You'll be able to utilize the octet rule to evaluate the expected behavior of a mix of atoms in a solution. You'll be able to learn the elements for the following abbreviations, C-H-O-P-K-I-N-S-C-A-F-E-N-A-C-L-M-G, and determine the electron configuration of any of those. You'll be able to describe chemical bonding, meaning you'll be able to differentiate between ionic covalent, including both polar and nonpolar covalent bonding, and hydrogen bonds. You'll be able to describe the characteristics and functions of the different types of bonds and explain how polar versus nonpolar bonding results in hydrophobic versus hydrophilic interactions and utilize chemical notation to properly symbolize chemical reactions and understand the difference between substrates and reactants and products in a reaction equation. Also, you'll be able to distinguish among the major types of chemical reactions that are important in the study of physiology. This includes decomposition, that includes hydrolysis hydration reactions, catabolic and exergonic, synthesis reactions, including dehydration, anabolic and endergonic, and reversible exchange and dissociation reactions, including ionization. You'll also be able to explain how the rate of chemical reactions are affected by reactants, concentration of reactants, temperature, pH, and the presence of enzymes. You'll be able to describe the chemical properties of water and how they make life possible. This includes solubility, reactivity, high heat capacity, and lubrication. You'll be able to describe different characteristics of a solution. So you'll be able to define solute and solvent and differentiate between the different types, whether it's aqueous, colloid, or suspension, and define molarity and osmolarity in regards to a solution. You'll be able to describe the importance of pH and the role of buffers in body fluids, this includes defining what pH measures to be able to identify items as acidic, neutral, and basic based upon their pH, and to describe how pH impacts molecular bonds and shape and differentiate between acidosis or alkalosis in the body. Further, you'll be able to distinguish between organic and inorganic compounds, compare and contrast the four classes of organic molecules, including polymers and monomers, and describe their structure and function in the cell and organism, explain the construction of these molecules through dehydration, synthesis, and hydrolysis. For carbohydrates, that will include mono antisaccharides. For proteins, this will be amino acids, and for those amino acids, you'll be able to describe the four protein structure levels and how those assemble. For lipids, we'll be looking at fatty acids and glycerol. Nucleic acids or nucleotides, You'll be able to describe the structure and function of DNA and the three major types of RNA, and to describe how the structure of an enzyme and its active site affect its function, and describe the mechanisms by which enzymes catalyze reaction and lower activation energy. Last page. 
Then you'll also be able to describe how the shape of an enzyme can change with a change in temperature or pH and how this can cause denaturation. You'll be able to explain the factors affecting enzymatic speed, including substrate concentration, enzyme concentration, temperature, pH, enzyme inhibition, and enzyme cofactors. You'll be able to describe the following characteristics of enzymes and relate to their function. This includes specificity, saturation limits, and feedback inhibition. You'll be able to define the role of enzymes in metabolism, so you'll be able to describe metabolic pathways, define the rate limiting step, describe end product inhibition, and you'll be able to describe the structure and function of DNA and the three major types of RNA, define the energy and describe different forms of energy, including potential energy, kinetic energy, chemical energy, and mechanical energy, and to list the parts of the ATP molecule and describe how the energy is in the phosphate bonds and explain the advantages of having ATP as an energy carrier in the body. In today's lecture, we're going to start with chapter two, section one, atomic structure. All right, so first let's talk about mass, weight, and matter. So matter is really anything at all that has mass and takes up space, okay? So matter can have a number of different states. You can have a solid state, a liquid state, or a gaseous state. So if we think of probably the most simple thing possible, water, you can imagine water in solid state is ice, water in liquid state is water, like we would drink or use for bathing, and then water in gas formation is going to be mist or humidity, right? So it can be in any of those three states, but it is still probably still the same thing. Now, mass and weight are two things that are pretty much the same thing when we talk about them on the planet Earth. However, it's not necessarily exactly the same thing. Now, weight is determined by the effect of gravity on mass. So, what that really means is that I might weigh <clears throat> 130 pounds. Um, <laughs> I don't really weigh 130 pounds. But anyway, if I were to weigh 130 pounds, I really would not weigh 130 pounds on the moon, for example, because gravity is different on the moon. I might be much lighter, for example. However, the mass that I would have on both the moon and on the earth is exactly the same. So that is the general take home between mass and weight. Weight is affected by gravity, and although weight is what we use, probably what we should talk about more often is mass, because that's a more standard and stable measurement. So atoms are the smallest stable units of matter, and they are composed of three primary subatomic particles that you need to learn for this course. There are other subatomic particles, but that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about in this class. So what you need to focus on are just protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons, with a P, have a positive charge, right? They have mass, and they're in the nucleus. Neutrons have a neutral charge, right? Neutrons, neutral. That's easy enough. And they also have mass, and they are also housed in the nucleus. Now, electrons are different. So the electrons have a negative charge, and they have very little mass. In fact, they're almost like one two thousandth of the size of other subatomic particles. And so they are going to be orbiting the nucleus in these valent shells that we'll talk about in subsequent slides. But the electrons are so small that they have effectively no mass effect on the actual atom itself. So atoms are electrically neutral because the number of protons, which are positive, is equal to the number of electrons, which are negative. And then elements are only going to be basically any atom in particular that has a unique set of numbers of protons and electrons in each atom. So when we look at the periodic table, it is the periodic table of elements that are distinguishable atoms that each have unique atomic masses. So those atomic numbers are going to be how we relate to each one of those. So this schematic here is pretty basic, but it gives you a really great visual of what we're looking at when we consider an atom in general. So let's just call this our standard run-of-the-mill atom. In the very center, you see yellow and red, and those are our protons and neutrons. Again, protons positive, neutrons are negatively charged. And so that is in the very center of the nucleus of the atom. And then you're going to see two rings that are around that nucleus. The first ring has two negatively charged electrons. And then the outer ring, you can see, has eight. And these are also negatively charged electrons. So as you may recall, it is these electrons in the outermost shell that are able to bond with another different atom and then create a compound. We'll talk about that coming up in a moment.
Okay, pop quiz question to see if you're following along so far. So I love this format of question where you have multiple things that you need to answer. So this is something you may anticipate to see on exams in this class. And I do this for a number of reasons. One is that we have a lot of content to cover and there is no way I can test you on every single thing that you learn. So you're gonna learn a huge volume of information and I'm gonna test you on a certain subset of it which is representative of your knowledge, okay? There's no way to test anybody on everything that would be insane, right? I'd basically have to ask you to write an entire textbook. So instead what we do is we pick these really great questions, something like this, in which case you have to know both things, right? So in this question, you need to know both what is the volume of a molecule and also what is the effect of gravity on a molecule. So if you were paying attention before, you would see that the volume of a molecule is going to be mass and then weight is what is the effect of gravity on the molecule. I gave you the example of how I might weigh <clears throat> a certain amount, um, but either way, the weight that I weigh is not going to be the same if I were on the moon versus if I were here on Earth because the effect of gravity changes weight. But mass does not change. Mass is stable. So we can say mass is the volume of a molecule and weight is going to be the effect of gravity on that same given molecule. So here's another good pop quiz question. So I love questions that are in the negative because instead of having to pick the one correct answer, you have to pick what is the one incorrect answer. <laughs> so it makes it a little more complicated and again, you have to know more information to be able to answer a question like this. So you have to think, which of the following particles is not found in the nucleus of an atom? So worst case scenario, you can always start scratching things out saying, okay, well I know what is and I know what isn't. And you might get down to maybe two, but if you think back to what we discussed earlier, we'll remember that there is both the proton and the neutron that are in the nucleus, right? And then the electrons which are negatively charged are in the outer valence shell of the electron. So which of the following particles is not found in the nucleus? It is the electron that is not found in the nucleus. It is in the shell. So this slide gives you a breakdown of what some of the common body elements are. And I think it's kind of fascinating to imagine that this is really what we're composed of. So on the right, you can see the bright lime green is showing you that's oxygen, and that occupies the vast majority of this pie chart. The second highest is going to be carbon, which is black, and the third is hydrogen. So that's really kind of interesting. So the acronym that you see on the left, SPONT, is going to let you recall what the first letter is of each of these different elements. And so 98% of our organic molecules are made up of sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. But there's also a few others that are present too that are very important and we will be discussing these much later. But calcium and potassium are going to have a lot of important roles coming up, especially when we discuss the roles of cell membrane permeability Magnesium is also very important, sodium as well, and there are others too, and they take up less actual weight as measured by dry weight, or really what we should say by dry mass. Here's the periodic table of the elements for your review. You'll recall that it's organized by a number of factors, but primarily the numbers that you see in the top left-hand corner of each of these elements will tell you what the atomic number is for that specific element. And then the very bottom of each of these boxes, you'll see another number, and that number is representing the atomic mass of the specific element. We'll get into this in a little more detail in the next slide, but for now, I just want you to look at helium, for example. Helium is in the top right-hand corner of the periodic table, and you'll see at the top left-hand corner of helium, the number two. And that two is the atomic number, and what the atomic number is, is the number of protons. Below that, you'll see 4.00, and what that is, is the atomic mass of helium. And the atomic mass is different than the atomic number, as you'll see, because the atomic number is 2, whereas the atomic mass is 4. So we'll do the math later on on the next slide, but I just want you to be familiar with the general layout of what we're talking about here. So let's discuss atomic structure. So the atomic number is just the raw number of protons present in the nucleus of a given element. The atomic mass, however, is the combination of adding protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you remember in the slide before, we looked in the top right hand corner of the periodic table at helium. 
and helium had the atomic number 2, but it had the atomic mass 4. So the atomic number 2 is indicating that there are two protons in helium, and the atomic mass being 4 is that there are two protons plus another two neutrons. Now atomic weight is different than atomic mass. Atomic mass is a very straight calculation of 2 plus 2 equals 4. The atomic weight is different in that it averages out multiple units of the same type of element. So you see down below that the atomic weight of carbon is 12 decibel 011. Okay, so that's a little bit of a weird number, and that's because it's taking multiple different types of carbon, different isotopes, which are atoms of the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons, and then averaging it out in order to get 12 decimal 011. So if we go a little further down the screen, you'll see two different versions of carbon. And if you didn't know what an isotope was, you might think the one on the right is incorrect, <laughs> but it is an isotope. So the difference that we're looking at between the two is if you look at the one on the left, it has an atomic mass of 12 and an atomic number 6. So we know that an atomic number means the number of protons. So both of these carbon have 6 protons, but they have a different atomic mass, right? So let's go back up to the atomic mass calculation, which is protons plus the number of neutrons. So we know on the left that there are 6 protons, and because there's 12, as an atomic mass, that's pretty easy, right? So 12 minus 6 is 6. So we have 6 protons and 6 neutrons in the first carbon. On the right, we have the 6 atomic number, so 6 protons, but we have 14 as an atomic mass. So if you were to subtract 6 from 14, you'd have 8, right? So this means that we have 2 additional neutrons in this isotope on the right as compared to the carbon on the left. So now these isotopes are very interesting and they actually have a lot of application in healthcare. They're used in a number of different ways. So some isotopes are unstable and will break down. Some break down slowly, some break down much more quickly. And what we discuss as breaking down at these different rates is its half-life. So that just generally means how long does it take for half of the isotope to decay. So if it decays very slowly, that could be something that's a little bit more stable and could be used for imaging or diagnostic procedures. Whereas if you have something that's maybe more strongly radioactive, that radioactivity can actually damage tissue in the surrounding area, so it can be very dangerous. But used in a controlled way, it can actually be a very important therapeutic tactic for patients who have various types of cancers. My husband actually works with this, by the way, in his career. He's an interventional radiologist, and if you're interested, I can tell you more about it. But for what it's worth, this actually will come up in your nursing careers as you have patients that are going to interventional radiology or get diagnosed with cancer and they end up taking interventional oncology treatment. So we know that all chemicals are not going to be just individual elements existing as individual units, right? We realize things have to go together like hydrogen and oxygen. So in this case, we have just an example molecule for you to look at. And you'll see a whole bunch of numbers and letters, and if you just looked at it right away, you might get overwhelmed, but don't, because this is super easy, okay? So the four, the number in green, is indicating the number of molecules, and the molecule is going to be the overall grouping of several elements together, okay? So we have four of this one molecule that you see listed out. In, the, in one of those molecules, you'll have six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. So if you wanted to hypothetically calculate, let's say, how many carbon atoms are there in this, what we're looking at here, which is four units of this molecule, we would basically take the number four that we see as the number of molecules and then multiply by carbons number six to have 24 carbon atoms total in this calculation. Okay, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please ask. I'm more than happy to go through this with you. Okay, pop quiz question time to see if you're paying attention and following along. So the simplest type of matter with unique physical and chemical properties is A or an A molecule, B mixture, C element, or D compound. So if it is the simplest type of matter, we know it can't be a mixture of anything, right? Because it would be just an individual element, right? So a molecule is made up of multiple elements, as is a compound. So what we're looking at here is C element. 
which subatomic particle is negatively charged. So we talked about protons, neutrons, and electrons earlier. We remember protons with a P are positively charged, right? And B, neutrons are neutral, so they don't have a positive or a negative charge, which leaves us with the default choice, if you didn't already know the answer, of C, electron. And then the last option is there just to throw you off, basically. But electron is the subatomic particle that is negatively charged. Okay, so here's a different way of looking at this. So we know that atoms are electrically neutral, right? So if they're neutral, then which two subatomic particles have to be equal in number? And remember, we just did this a few moments ago. So remember that the protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative, right? So if the positive and negative equal out to be neutral, then it has to be the electrons and the protons. Okay, so one last question. By definition, the atomic number is equal to the number of what that an atom has? Is it neutrons, electrons, protons, or positrons? So what we're thinking right away, I'm sure you're thinking right off the bat, is it's got to be protons, right? Because we just did all that math calculating atomic mass. So it is protons. Here's a quick overview of what a carbon atom actually looks like. So first you'll look at the very center, that's our nucleus, and you'll notice that it holds 6p, 6n, so that is 6 protons and 6 neutrons. And then you have subsequent rings around that nucleus, and we're going to discuss these in a little more detail coming up. But for now, you'll just notice that there are two electrons orbiting in that very first orbital around the nucleus, and then the outer one, there are four. Okay. Now, typically, there would be eight in order to be stable in the outer ring, and that is called the octet rule. So if you were to imagine three different rings going around in a circle, you would have two in the very first, just because it's a small circle, imagine it that way, and then the next two rings should ideally each have eight in order to make it stable. We'll talk about this more coming up in the very next slide. So here's a little bit more detail looking at atomic arrangement. So orbitals, that is the name for the circling area in which the electrons orbit around the nucleus. And atoms that have a stable outer orbital are going to be non-reactive, meaning they're not going to interact as much with other elements around them. So first off, let's look at hydrogen at the top left of this image. So you'll see that it has one proton in the nucleus and it also has one electron circling in the electron shell, or this is also known as the first energy level. Same thing, okay? So then when you look over at helium on the right, you'll see a different set of structures happening here. We have two neutrons and two protons in the nucleus, and we also have two electrons moving around in that first orbital, okay? In that first energy level. And you can see, by the way, that the artist here has indicated that the electrons are negative by putting that little negative dash next to all of the E's so that that's a little hot tip for you. So now when we look down at the next two elements we have lithium and neon at the bottom and what you'll notice by comparison with the two above the hydrogen and the helium is that there's a second energy level or a second electron shell that is further out away from the center or to use some of your terminology from chapter one it is distal <laughs> to the nucleus, okay? So the more proximal one is the closer one, and that's the one that you see only in the first two images at the top, hydrogen and helium. But the bottom two, lithium and neon, they both have an innermost first energy level electron shell, and they have that second energy level or electron shell with various numbers of electrons in them. So what you'll notice when you look at neon is in its outer ring that there are eight electrons circling in the orbital, and that's ideal. This makes it the most stable possible uh, structure that you could imagine when we're talking about atomic arrangements. So what we would like to see for a stable atom would be two electrons in the innermost orbital, and that's different than the remaining orbitals. The other two orbitals in subsequent steps moving out away from the nucleus should have eight electrons in the second and eight in the third to be stable. So the two in the center, it's different, right? You'd like to think it should be an octet rule applying to all of those different energy levels, but just think of it this way. 
the circle that's closest around the nucleus is smaller, so there's not enough space for eight, okay? So there's only two in that first electron shell, but then in the next two energy levels or electron shells, eight is the required number for it to be stable. You can virtually guarantee I'll have a question like this coming up on the exam. So pay attention to this and calculate this exact formula for multiple different atoms and see if you're comfortable with it, okay? So let's go through this one together. The atomic number of a chlorine atom is 17 and the mass is 35. So knowing those two things, what is the number of protons, what is the number of neutrons, and what is the number of electrons in the atom? Okay, so let's start off with what we know. So we know that the atomic number is what? The number of protons, right? So right off the bat, we know that there are 17 protons. Great, we've got one done. And then we have to think, well, wait a second here. So if the atomic mass is 35 and the atomic number is 17, we know that we add the protons and the neutrons together in order to get the atomic mass, right? So we would have 17 plus what equals 35? So we can do exactly an opposite reverse formation, right? 35 minus 17 is what? 18, right? So we know that we have 18 neutrons. And then how many electrons do we have? Well, if we have to have a neutrally charged atom, right, we're going to have to have balanced the number of protons and electrons. So if we have an atomic number of 17, meaning that we have 17 positively charged protons, P and P, we have to have also 17 negatively charged electrons. Okay, practice this with other different elements. I'm telling you it will help. You've seen this image before just a couple slides ago, but we're going to discuss it again because we need to be able to think about where those electrons actually are. And like I said before, we can't really know where any electron is truly at any specific given moment, but we can generally tell how many electrons are going to be in each of these electron shells or energy levels. So remember we have the octet rule for the second and third shells, but there's only two electrons in that first electron shell because it's a smaller circle, right? <laughs> so let's look at hydrogen. In this case, we only have one uh, sorry, one electron circling in that first energy level. So, okay, it only has one, that's all it is. It goes in the first and we're done. By contrast, we have helium, which has two electrons in that first electron shell. So all two of the electrons for that one element are all going to be in that first electron shell. It's full and therefore it's stable. Now let's go down to lithium. So lithium has three protons and three neutrons, right, in the nucleus and also has three electrons circling. So remember that very first electron shell in the center is small, it can only have two, so it has two electrons, but then where's the third one go? The third one is gonna go into that next second electron shell. So that third electron is hanging out there by himself, totally lonely, and this actually makes the element unstable because it doesn't have eight. So this element, lithium, is going to be looking probably to donate its electron to another element in order to create a compound or a molecule. Um, and by contrast, let's look at neon. And neon is exactly the opposite. You can see in the outer, el sorry, outer electron shell that there are eight electrons circling. So that means it's full. There's no more that can possibly be added. So if there was one more electron that was going to be added, it would have to go into a third electron shell. Okay, so we have two in the center, eight in the next two electron shells. So this is an example of another great exam question. How many electrons are there in the outer orbital of an oxygen atom? So I've included for you here what the actual oxygen atom looks like when it's on the periodic table of elements. So for your reference, remember eight in the top left hand corner, that's going to be our atomic number. At the bottom we have our atomic weight, right, because it's average, so we can say that's 16 to make life easy, okay, so the atomic mass is 16 for all purposes here. So if we know that we have eight protons and we have then eight neutrons, both in the nucleus, then 16 minus eight is another eight, right? So we know we have eight electrons total in an oxygen atom. So of those eight, sorry, eight electrons, where will they be? So in the very first orbital, we have two, right? So eight minus two uh, is six. 
and then the six will go into the second and outer orbital and it won't complete it because we don't have eight to make it totally stable. So therefore there can only be six in the outer orbital of an oxygen atom. We're going to discuss ions and polarity more in subsequent slides, but for now, suffice it to say that ions are what forms when an atom loses or gains an electron. Okay? So normally we're going to look at an atom and consider it to be neutrally charged, but that's just the element sitting there by itself, minding its own business, doing nothing. That's not the way it works, right? They're always bouncing into one another in the environment. And so when that happens, they can lose or gain, or sometimes even share an electron. But when they lose or gain the electron, it changes the charge on the atom into either negative or positive. Now, molecules, if you recall from your text, are those that have two or more different elements, right? And so two or more elements forming a molecule can actually carry a charge. And if it does, that charge can be positive or negative. So in that case, that would be considered a polar molecule because it has areas that carry a charge. Nonpolar molecules are those molecules that have no charge whatsoever, or they're equally distributed charges throughout the molecule. All right, let's move into chemical bonds. Next, let's talk about chemical bonding. So there are several different types of chemical bonds, and we'll discuss this in the next several slides. The first we're going to discuss is ionic bonding. And ionic bonding is basically when you have an electron that is given away from one atom and given to another. And it's transferred in this exact way, so that way we create stability, which is what we're trying to achieve. So the atom on the left, you can see, has one lone electron floating around by itself in its orbital. And the atom on the right, by contrast, has seven electrons circling in its orbital. So in order for it to become stable, it needs to gain an electron. And for the one on the left, for it to become stable, it needs to give it away. So having the electron donor on the left donate the electron to the electron acceptor on the right, it creates stability and results in a compound that is a moderately strong bond, and it is the most polar bond too. So the outcome of this is that the outer surface of this combined compound now that it's bonded by this electron exchange is we're going to have either a positive or a negative charge on the outer surface. So think of it this way. Both of these two atoms were neutrally charged prior to this bonding event, okay? So if they were neutral to begin with and then there's a change, what happens? So the one on the left was neutral and it gave away an electron so now it has one fewer electrons than it should have, okay? And the one on the right, by contrast, is the opposite. It was neutral too, but now it's gained an electron. So the one on the right has actually become more negative, and the one on the left has become more positive because it lost an electron. electron. So these are called cations and anions. We'll discuss those more in one second. But first, I want to mention... What about the proton? What's happening with the protons in the nucleus? We haven't discussed those. What happens here? Nothing. They just sit and hang out in the nucleus. That's unaffected. The only thing that's affected here in this process is the electron that is exchanged and moved over to a different valent shell. Here is yet another really good exam type question. So if an atom of calcium were to lose two electrons, what is the charge on the calcium ion? And is it a cation or an anion? Well, first off, quick note up at the top here, we've got anions are negative, and negative ion, anion, and a cation is a positive ion, okay? So if an atom of calcium, which should be neutrally charged, loses two electrons, what is the charge on the calcium ion now? Well, it has to be more positive, right? Because it's lost some of its electrons and it was stable then. So now that it's lost those electrons, it actually is more positive. And so if it's positive, then is it a cation or an anion? And the answer is cation. So this schematic here explains visually what it is we were discussing in the previous couple of slides. So in this case, what's happening is you can see on the left, we have our sodium atom and it has 11 protons, 11 electrons, and remember, this is supposed to be a neutrally charged element, right? So you can see after Na, the code for sodium, there is neither a positive or a negative symbol, right? It is neutrally charged. 
Now, by contrast, the one on the right, you can see, is a positive indication after the Na because it's a positively charged ion. Why is it positively charged? Well, because this version of sodium here has given away its electron in a, sorry, in an ionic bond, and so by giving it away, it is now more positively charged. It is also, by the way, more stable because you can see that the outer valence shell has eight electrons, whereas previously, before it lost its electron in that outer shell, it had one electron floating out there by itself alone. This slide is essentially the exact inverse of the previous slide, and I want to go through this with you to make sure that you understand these ideas really well. What I'm trying to drive home here is the idea of how the outer valence shell can become negatively or positively charged contingent upon the donation or accepting of an, a sorry, an electron from another atom. So in this case, if you look on the left, we have a chloride atom. It has 17 protons, 17 electrons, and you can see that they're arranged as follows. So if we're counting up to 17, the first two go in the first center small orbital, and then there are eight more in the next orbital, so now we're up to 10, right? But we still have seven more electrons, so they will go into the third valence shell, okay? So this is a neutral chloride atom. On the right, though, we have a chloride atom that has gained an electron, okay? So you can see the outer valence shell has an additional atom, sorry, an additional electron, so it has eight. So in this case now, chloride will have a negative symbol because negatively charged ions, which are known as anions, are present and being charged, sorry, being created as a result of accepting this additional electron. So the idea here is basically it was neutral before and now I've got an additional electron and the electron is negatively charged, so now it's negative, right? The exact opposite is true in the previous slide. If you give away an electron, well, you were neutral before, and with less electrical negativity, you become positive, okay? So if you lose an electron, you become positive. If you gain an electron, you become more negative. Next, we're gonna talk about covalent bonding. And covalent bonding is as nice as it sounds. It's sharing. It's sharing electrons between two different atoms, okay? We can have single, double, or triple bonds, which we'll get into later. For now, we're just going to talk about single covalent bonding. And this can be either polar or nonpolar. And you may wonder, well, how is that possible? Well, it depends on whether the electrons are going to be shared equally, which is called nonpolar, or unequally, which is called polar. So the way I like to explain this is with a ball toss analogy. So if there are two children throwing a ball back and forth from one to the other, you would hope that they would share equally, which means they would each hold the ball in their hands for only a couple seconds before giving it back to their friend. Now, in this case, if they were sharing it equally, that would be an example of a nonpolar sharing of the bond, right? If they're throwing the ball back and forth, it's equivalent to two different atoms having the electron kind of equally shared between them fairly. However, think about two children who are, let's say, toddlers like my son. If I were to give him a ball, he's more or less going to hang on to it for as long as he likes and then give it back to me when he feels like it, and he will eventually feel like it, but I have to wait. In that case, this is an unequal ball toss game, and that is going to be an unequal or polar covalent bond, okay? So the image on the right is showing you up top that there's no interaction whatsoever bet between the two hydrogen atoms, okay? They're too far apart. They just totally stay far apart from one another. However, as they approach and become closer to one another, the electrons in the outer shell, remember electrons are negative and the protons are positive in the nucleus, so the positively charged nucleus is going to attract the electron from the other, and vice versa. So they kind of pull together. And so once they pull together, they're going to create a covalent bond because they are sharing the electrons in that outer valence shell. And that outer valence shell now is also stable because it has two electrons. And so this is an example of something like hydrogen, for example, in which hydrogen is known with a chemical name of just H, but the actual molecular term for hydrogen is going to be H2, because it naturally exists as the structure you see down at the bottom, having the two different atoms together. So which type of ion is formed when an atom gains one or more electrons? So first off, 
Remember, what's the difference between a cation and an anion? Well, cations are positive, anions are negative, right? So if an atom is going to gain an electron, it was stable beforehand, but it's getting another electron, it's getting more negative. So it's becoming more negative. What type of ion is formed? It's an anion. If you've been reading your textbook carefully, you'll find that there's a difference between a molecule and a compound, right? So if you have two or more atoms and they are ionically bonded, they are now going to form a compound, which is different. They have oppositely charged ions together. So for example, sodium chloride would be a great example of an ionically bonded compound. Another question. An ionic bond is formed by what? Is it the sharing of electrons? Well, remember the sharing of electrons would be a covalent bond, so we can rule out A right away. The loss of electrons from two atoms? Well, that can't quite be it, right? Because they can't both be losing electrons. And then D, they're not gaining from two atoms, but an ionic bond is actually formed by the attraction between cations and anions when one atom loses and another gains electrons. So one type of covalent bond is the nonpolar covalent bond. And this is common in organic molecules because of the presence of carbon, right? Now, electrons are going to be shared equally here, if we remember that ball toss. So if they're equally shared, what that means is that the outer valence shell is going to be pretty stable and it's going to hold that together. So the examples you see here are things like CO2 or H2, right? Because two hydrogen uh, atoms will together form a hydrogen molecule that will be very stable and that's the way it's found in the natural world. Carbon dioxide is the same thing. We have two oxygens and one carbon here, and oxygen is a similar type of element in which it will be found in nature in a state with two oxygen atoms together. So these nonpolar molecules are soluble in nonpolar sorry, solvents such as alcohol, and these are some of the very most common bonds in the human body. Okay, this looks more complicated but it's really not, and you already understand this, but let's walk through it together. So this is a nonpolar covalent bond. So covalent bond, they're sharing electrons in their outer orbital, and that keeps the whole structure stable, right? So what we have in the center is we have a carbon atom, and that carbon atom has six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. In the first energy level or electron shell, we have two electrons, and then we have eight, in the very last, which is great, it's stable. And it's stable with those four different hydrogens attached with nonpolar covalent bonds. So the carbon and the hydrogen are all sharing one electron each. So let's look at one hydrogen atom specifically. So let's pick one, top right hand corner, whatever, they're all the same. But the top right hand corner one, you can see it has one uh, proton in the nucleus, and then it has two electrons that it's sharing with the carbon, right? So those two satisfy two different criteria here. It is satisfying the desire to have two electrons in the valence shell of the hydrogen, so the hydrogen is stable, and also it creates, or it helps to create, eight electrons in the outer valence shell of the carbon, okay? So this is replicated several times. And so in this case, what we have is a compound is formed, and this is methane, which is CH4. And so you can see in that outer valence shell, you took four electrons that were originally in that valence shell. And instead of just having the four, it bonded with four additional hydrogen atoms to create stability. And so this is a very stable molecule. Okay, so the universe tends towards stability or at least so I hope. So this is a nonpolar double covalent bond of oxygen. So we have two oxygen atoms, each have eight protons and eight neutrons in the nucleus. So if we're counting up, we have two electrons in each of the first energy levels or electron shells, and then we would have six electrons in an individual oxygen atom, right? So if each of these only has six, You'll notice that if you count for one circle, including the four that you see down the center, you now have eight. And why is that? It's because it is sharing two sets 
of electrons in that outer valence shell. So in so doing, both of these oxygen atoms become stable as an oxygen gas molecule known as O2. Now by contrast, a polar covalent bond is an unequal sharing of electrons. And so there will be both partially positive and partially negative sides of the same molecule. So this gets a little bit more complicated. Anyway, this is common in molecules with oxygen and includes things like water and the phosphate groups of phospholipids. In a polar covalent bond, the atoms are shared between a couple different atoms, but they're shared unequally. And this unequal sharing will result in a charge that creates a polar molecule. So let's look at water, which is very stable. So we break it down into its constituent parts. We have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Now the oxygen atoms only have one electron, because that's, that's normal, but they're not stable, right? Because they should have two electrons in the outer shell, their valence shell, in order to be stable. Similarly, oxygen only has six atoms in its outer valence shell, and ideally it should be a full complement of eight. So when these two come together, you end up with two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom creating H2O, water, right? And so you can see in the image on the right, what this looks like when it comes together is you have something that looks like a Mickey Mouse hat, basically. So the ears of the Mickey Mouse hat would be the hydrogen atoms, and you can see that it now has a full complement of two electrons in their valence shells, so that's great, it's very stable. And also the oxygen atom has eight in its valence shell, so it's very stable too. So that's great news. But here's the thing, with a polar covalent bond, the sharing that's being done is not equal. The oxygen atom attracts the hydrogen atoms much more strongly than the hydrogen atoms will attract the oxygen atom to it. So you end up with a more electric, uh, sorry, electrically negative charge on the oxygen side of the molecule and a more positive charge on the hydrogen atom end. So we've already discussed polar bonds and covalent bonds, and those are considerably stronger than hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds in and of themselves are actually pretty weak, but they do help to hold something together. So they're more of a supportive bond than they are an individual concrete bond, if you want to think of it that way. So where they exist is typically between separate polar covalent molecules. And so these molecules are already held together with the polar covalent bond of sharing the electrons in the outer orbital, although they're sharing it unequally. That's what makes it polar covalent, right? But they'll also help to pull together widely separated atoms in a single molecule. Okay, so the example that's given in the text is typically of water, and that's a great example because it creates surface tension, which will allow things like, for example, this bug that you see here on the right, it's actually incapable of breaking through the molecules on the surface of the water that are held together by the hydrogen bonds. And so the hydrogen bond is just basically the attraction between a slight positive charge on a, say for example, a hydrogen atom of a polar covalent bond, and also of a slight negative charge on the oxygen bond, sorry, oxygen molecule or a number of others. So you can look at the previous slide for the polar covalent bond example to take a look at what that might look like. Another pop quiz question to keep you on your toes. So when electron pairs are shared equally between two atoms, what type of bond is formed? So this slide is asking you basically to put together the information that you've learned in subsequent slides and try to determine based off the definition what sort of bond is being described. So the key word here that we're gonna pay attention to is equally, right? We are sharing electron pairs equally. So we can definitely rule out our hydrogen and ionic bonds. So now that leaves us with the two covalent bond options because covalent share equally, right? So, sorry, they both share. One shares equally, the other one does not share equally. So polar covalent bonds do not share equally. So what the answer is here is A, nonpolar covalent bonds. Here we are with section two hyphen three, decomposition, synthesis, and exchange reactions. Before we get into decomposition, synthesis, and exchange reactions, let's talk about some basic energy concepts first. So a chemical reaction is defined as either a new bond being formed or existing bonds being broken. It can go either way. Reactants are substances that will house the reacting substances, 
and products are substances that are newly formed by a reaction. Work can be defined as movement of an object or a change in its structure. And energy is really the capacity for work. So we talk about energy in two main ways. One is kinetic energy, which is basically motion, right? So we're transferring energy from one object to another. We're pushing a ball up a hill, for example, with kinetic energy. Potential energy is different because it's stored energy based on our position. So if we're poised to fall, for example, or poised to jump, it could be physical or a chemical structure as well. Okay, let's talk about chemical reactions. These can feel a little bit confusing, but let's just walk through it kind of slowly, and I think it should all make sense. So first, let's talk about decomposition reactions. So think about if a dead body, for example, is decomposing, what's happening? It's breaking down, right? It's breaking down into fragments. So that's exactly what's happening in a decomposition reaction. So this letter example hopefully illustrates for you that if you start off with AB together, whatever A and B are, they start off together and then they become just individual A and individual B, right? Just those two individual substances are broken down. So a hydrolysis reaction is a similar type of decomposition reaction. In fact, it is a type of decomposition reaction, but it specifically is breaking down water. So what you'll see in this example is you have AB, whatever that might be, and water breaks down to become water is separated now, so it can be removed. So it's AH plus BOH. Now all decomposition reactions are considered catabolism, which is different than anabolism, which we'll discuss in a moment. But the general idea is anything catabolic is having a breakdown, whereas anything anabolic, you are building something up. So if you think about anabolic steroids, which make your muscles big, anabolism and synthesis reactions are all anabolic. So let's talk about synthesis reactions. So this is when we take small molecules and we just assemble them into larger ones, right? So if you have two individual elements, let's say A and B, and then we assemble them together, now we have AB together, right? So that's pretty easy, this is basic algebra. And then we have dehydration synthesis, which is also known as condensation. So the dehydration synthesis reaction is basically removing water from the substance itself. So you can see here that we start off with AH and BOH, and what we get at the end of a dehydration synthesis reaction is AB and H2O. Okay. So again, keep in mind that all decomposition reactions are catabolism and all synthesis reactions are anabolism. Exchange reactions are those in which the substrates exchange parts to create two totally new molecules. Okay. So all the same parts are there, they're just being switched around. So here's an example, and take a look at this to understand that first what's happening is we have to have these molecules undergo decomposition and then synthesis. And what that means is first they break down so that way they can be rebuilt together. So we have the example of AB and CD. Those are two separate molecules, and they basically switcheroo their partners. It's like wife and husband swapping, if you want to think of it that way, to have AD and CB. But first, before these new couples could get married, they have to get divorced. So you can think of an exchange reaction like that. Now, a reversible reaction is a little bit different um, because basically all chemical reactions are reversible, but it's not just switcherooing. It's actually something that goes in one direction and then could also technically go back the other. So for example, A and B as two separate entities can become AB and sing sorry, and similarly, AB can also go back and become A and B individually. Okay, so two people individually can live in their own and then also they could become a married couple, but that marriage could result in divorce and then they go back to being single people again. So that's the idea of a reversible reaction. So we have another example below that's much more complicated, but it's basically showing you the different permutations that can arise from the exact same thing. This question is asking you to name the part of the reaction that is underlined. So if you look at the underlined area, we have H2CO3, which is going to become H plus HCO3, okay? So if we are taking that one H2CO3 and breaking it down into constituent parts, we have a decomposition reaction. This question is asking you to name the part of the reaction that is underlined. 
And so if you look at this, we're starting off with water and carbon dioxide, which is becoming H2CO3. So water is involved, but what we're doing here is we're building two smaller molecules into one larger molecule. So this is definitely a synthesis reaction. This question is asking you to differentiate between hydrolysis and dehydration reactions. So if you look back at our notes, you'll see that when we're creating a new H2O, so that way it could theoretically evaporate off, we're creating a dehydration reaction. And what's happening here is exactly that. So if you look at the underlined part, start at the right part of it, because look at what direction the arrow is going. It's going to the left, not to the right, okay? So in this case, we have H2CO3, which is becoming CO2 and H2O. So this is a perfect example of a dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction. Now we're going to discuss enzymes, which is section 2-4 in your textbook. Please note that we're going to be discussing cofactors and coenzymes in this section because it makes sense to me while we're discussing enzymes, even though technically it's listed under 2-12 in proteins, just for your reference. The function of an enzyme is just to lower the activation and energy of a chemical reaction. So for example, what that means is, is that you don't need as much heat to trigger a chemical reaction. But that said, what they're really doing is functioning as a catalyst. And catalysts are amazing because what they do is they speed up a chemical reaction without themselves being changed or consumed. So that is really important. So substrates have to bind to a specific region on the membrane, and that region is called the active site. And so the tertiary or quaternary structure of the enzyme is what's going to determine what the shape is of the active site. And keep in mind that there are different enzymes that are required to metabolize each isomer. So we have a whole number of different enzymes that are involved. In future labs, you're going to be working with enzymes to be able to assess how they affect the rate of a reaction. Now we already know that the function of an enzyme is to lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction, but which factors affect it in which direction? So here is a list. So if you decrease the temperature, you're going to decrease the rate of a reaction, right? This makes sense because we're slowing down molecular movement with decreased temperature. But then as we increase temperature, we're going to actually increase the rate of the reaction occurring, which makes sense because with heat, we're going to have more molecules moving around more quickly. So that would facilitate molecules running into one another more frequently, which would then result in the rate going up. Also, when you have an increased temperature, if it's too high, you can denature the proteins. Further, if you lower or raise the pH, that can decrease the rate because for the most part, most reactions have an ideal pH. So any deviation from it is going to totally ruin everything and denature your proteins. If you increase the reactant concentration, that will probably increase the rate of your reaction. And also, if you increase the enzyme concentration, then you have more workers to help get the work done, right? The enzymes are doing the heavy lifting of speeding things up. So with more of those workers, you will get more done sooner. So that increases the rate. I like to think of coenzymes and cofactors as the behind the scenes workers who get a lot done and help to facilitate things, but they really don't get any credit. I mean, if you look at enzymes, they're basically facilitating reactions they get a little bit more credit, but nobody ever knows what a coenzyme or a cofactor is, right? So let's discuss this a little bit. So cofactors are ions or molecules, and they have to bind with an enzyme before any other substrate can bind with that enzyme. So if you don't have a cofactor there, then the enzyme might be intact, but it won't work, okay? So it's really pretty important. Coenzymes are non-protein organic molecules, and these can function as cofactors, okay? So our body converts a whole bunch of vitamins into essential coenzymes. Um, vitamins, for example, that we consume in our diets are oftentimes very important because we can't synthesize them ourselves, so we have to eat them. Now, both coenzymes and cofactors can be required in some situations to attach the enzymes before these enzymes will work at all. This slide here describes how enzyme structure and function interrelate. So from your text, you can follow along with this image as well. So in step one, you'll see that there are two substrates and they're gonna to bind to the two active sites on the surface of the enzyme. And so in step two, once they bind to the active site, the two substrates are held together 
and this makes the interaction between the two of them easier. And then in the third step, that substrate binding at the active site is going to overall alter the shape of the enzyme, and then that change is going to promote the product formation. And the product formation is, you can see in step four, those two separate substrates that came in independently to meet the enzyme, they have now been bound together, and then that byproduct will detach from the enzyme and because those active sites remain, because enzymes are not changed or consumed through the process of this interaction, this whole process can be repeated over again. Let's talk about water. It's section 2-6 in your text. Water has some properties which make it absolutely essential for our lives. So first off, water is considered the universal solvent, right? And so a solvent is something to which solutes will dissolve into, and then together with the solutes dissolved into the solvent, that will be now a solution. So here's another quick example of what a solvent, solution, and solute situation would be. So if you were to take sugar and add sugar to water to create sugar water, the sugar would be the solute, the water again would be the solvent in this example, and then together the sugar water would form a solution. Now another way that water is very important is that it's involved in both hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. And another key factor is that it has a high heat capacity. And a high heat capacity is just defined as basically the amount of energy that it takes to increase the temperature one degree Celsius for a given amount of a certain substance. So water takes an awful lot of heat to raise the temperature one degree Celsius. And this is really important for a number of reasons. It keeps our body temperature stable because we're composed of so much water. Also, if you think about something like swimming pools, for example, once they obtain a certain temperature, they don't just drop to the ambient temperature around them overnight when it gets cool. They hold on to their heat for quite a bit, otherwise everybody's energy bills for heating their pools would be sky high. Another thing about water is that it is created with polar covalent bonds, and because of this, it is considered a polar solvent. And so this is based off of the orientation of the molecule of H2O. So remember I talked to you about the Mickey Mouse ears sort of thing before? the ears being the hydrogen atoms, because those two hydrogen atoms are close to one another, they're held together with those hydrogen bonds. Further, there are many uses and functions of water. So we've already talked about how it's a solvent for all of our body fluids, ranging from urine to blood to everything, our lymphatic fluid, and it evaporates slowly, which is very helpful. So otherwise, if it evaporated very quickly, we'd be dehydrated all the time, requiring an awful lot of water, right? but also it helps to keep us cool. So whenever we do perspire, that moisture on our skin surface, when the sweat turns from water state as a liquid to gas state to evaporate off of us, it takes a lot of heat with it, which is why perspiring is such a fantastic way to cool our body temperatures. And lastly, the ions in polar compounds are gonna undergo ionization or dissociation in water. So dissociation is just when you split a compound down into its constituent molecules, okay? And then ionization is taking that one step further. So you're breaking down those molecules into individual ions. So this image is right out of your textbook. On the left, let's start off with our water molecule. And you remember it's got that typical Mickey Mouse sort of formation, right? With the ears being the hydrogen atoms. And so we have a bipolar molecule, right? So one end is going to be more negatively charged and one end is going to be more positively charged as we previously described. So in this water molecule, it's held together with a number of different bonds, right? We have our polar covalent bonds, but we also have hydrogen bonds too, right? So now let's take a look at what's happening when we have water and sodium chloride or table salt in water, okay? So in the center image, it's showing you many little water molecules floating around. So all those little Mickey Mouse hats, those are all our water molecules, just as an example, floating around. And then we also have a number of other things floating around. We have chloride and we have sodium atoms floating around. And what they have glommed onto the surface are a number of H2O molecules, right? And so they are being attracted because they are hydrophilic. Philic meaning loving and hydro, of course, meaning water, okay? So we have hydrophilic substances, the sodium and the chlorine, and so that is attracting the water to attach to it. And when those water molecules attach to it, it helps it to break down, basically.
And now another example here we see on the right is we have glucose. So glucose is just sugar, right? And so you're seeing hydration spheres form around this molecule as well. And so if this molecule, the glucose here, has the water attract to it strongly, then in that case, it carries it into the solution. And when we say carries it into solution, what we mean is that it dissolves. We already discussed hydrophilic molecules, right? So hydrophilic molecules attract water or are water loving. Now hydrophobic molecules are exactly the opposite. They repel water or it's water fearing. Think about phobias like arachnophobia, the movie back from the early 90s. That was fear of spiders, right? So phobic repels water and instead it attracts oil, which is very different. So the best example I can give you of this so that way you can try to remember it is soap, okay? So soap is a polar molecule and what it does is it basically, in forming a lather, has both a hydrophobic part of the soap molecule and a hydrophilic part of the molecule. So the hydrophobic part of the soap molecule will attract oil and dirt, right? And then the hydrophilic end is what attaches to water. So the dirt attaches to the hydrophobic end and then washes away with the water because it goes with the hydrophilic end. And you see the word micelle at the bottom? It's a French term, and you'll see it in a lot of different face washes these days if you ever walk down the beauty aisle at Target, for example. And micelles are basically just, it's bubbly water, more or less is really what it comes down to. So if you're buying a micellar solution, you're really more or less buying dilute soap. There's really no other way around it. It does the exact same thing as regular soap, but in this case, you're actually purchasing a lot more water than as opposed to if you just bought a regular bar of soap in which you add the water and lather yourself. Colloids and suspensions are very similar in that they both are solutions that have some particles in them. The difference will be that colloids will have those proteins or large molecules remain homogeneous indefinitely. They'll never settle. Whereas in a suspension, those little particles are suspended only temporarily. So eventually all of those particles will settle and create layers. So the best example of a suspension is blood. So if you look at the image on the right, you'll see three different tubes of blood that demonstrate different things happening with a patient. So blood settles into three main constituent parts. You have red blood cells, which is the hematocrit or the red part of the tube that you're seeing on the right. The buffy coat, which is just a thin little white layer that includes white blood cells and platelets. And then typically the majority is going to be plasma, which is water, proteins, nutrients, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see the very first tube on the left is showing you what a normal blood sample will look like after it has sat for a while. Whereas on the far right, you're gonna see a polycythemia case, and this would be called an elevated hematocrit because we have much more red blood cells present in this tube than we do in the normal sample. By contrast, the middle tube is showing you a depressed hematocrit with very few red blood cells. As you can see, there's a whole lot of plasma in this case. So somebody with anemia, you could expect to be very tired because they don't have the same oxygen, sorry, oxygen carrying capacity on the hemoglobin of their red blood cells because they have fewer red blood cells. So suspensions are things like blood, whereas colloid is something like jello. Next, let's talk about pH. It's section 2-7 in your text. When you look at the top of the screen and you see pH, you might be inclined to think that there's a spelling error here, but there actually isn't because the lowercase p indicates power and the uppercase h stands for hydrogen. So what pH literally translates to is the power of hydrogen. And the full definition of pH is that it's indicating the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration in moles per liter. Now that sounds complicated, but it's really not if we just think about what logarithm means in the first place. So the pH scale being log sorry, logarithmic, what this really means is that each step or each level that you see color coded on the right is 10 times greater than the next, okay? So what this means is that a pH of six is 10 times greater concentration of hydrogen than a pH of seven. So it seems backwards, right? That's because it is a negative logarithm, not a positive logarithm. If it were a positive logarithm, then for example, 14 would be much higher, but instead it's actually a much, much, much lower level than a pH of one. 
So what this translates to is when we talk about whether things are acids or if they're neutral or basic or whatever, we are going to be using one of these numbers that you see color coded. And so a range of one to seven would be considered acidic. So think about your citric acid if you're into canning or eating just citrus fruits, for example. Those are acids. Seven would be considered perfectly neutral. And then anything between seven, say 7.1. So above seven to 14 is going to be basic or also known as alkaline. So pop quiz question. So is a pH of three going to be acidic, basic, or neutral? So if we take a look at the image on the right, I've given you some examples of things that you can look at. So a pH of three correlates to being grapefruit or orange juice or a soft drink, right? So it's fairly acidic. So we can say that pH of three is acidic. This chart might be helpful for you to look at just to help you kind of remember because it's easy to get confused on which is the basic end and which is the acidic end. So take a look at this and keep in mind that number 14, that would be a pH of 14 and it's extremely alkaline. And these super alkaline solutions will be very caustic. So for example, Drano or liquid drain cleaner falls into this kind of category. Let's take a look at section 2-8 acids, bases, and salts. Some definitions of acid, bases, and salts are as follows. So acids are those that release hydrogen ions, and so for that reason they're also called proton donors. Now the exact opposite is true of a base. So a base is going to remove a hydrogen ion, or in this case they're called a proton acceptor. So there are some notes here. So like strong acids or bases will ionize completely, but weak acids or weak bases will ionize incompletely. Now, salts are a different thing altogether. Now, salts are electrolytes that have cations. Remember, cations are positively charged ions, right? And anions are the negatively charged ions. So it's an electrolyte with a cation that is not hydrogen, okay? And hydrogen is OH+, plus. that's our code for it. And anions that are not hydroxide ions, which are OH and the negative symbol. Lastly, buffers are going to be present to remove or replace the hydrogen ions in a solution. And what they do is they really maintain pH so it's a little bit more stable and it helps to maintain homeostasis. So you'll see buffers, for example, in something like buffered aspirin. And that's important to help make sure that it doesn't irritate your stomach as much. Next, we'll discuss monomers and polymers briefly. You're going to love this concept because it's so straightforward. Monomers and polymers. So first let's talk about the macromolecules of life. So all of the macromolecules of life are organic compounds and ultimately they are just long chains of carbon atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. And so when you have these chains of carbon atoms tied together with covalent bonds, they can be either a monomer or a polymer. And a monomer is a molecule that can bond to other identical molecules of the same sort to form a polymer. So it's basically a monomer is an individual on its own and a polymer is effectively like a clone of itself if you want to think of it that way. So lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids are all monomers that can become polymers. While it may not be as appealing as a nice big bowl of macaroni and cheese, nonetheless let's talk about carbohydrates in section 2-10 in your text. Carbs, how I love thee. So here's something interesting. While carbohydrates occupy less than 1% of our total body weight, they're also a major part of our diet. So what that infers is that this is something that we typically ingest and metabolize rather than store in our bodies for the most part. So carbohydrates are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a one to two to one ratio specifically. And they serve as a quick energy source that's catabolized. So some examples of this would include sugars and starches. So the building blocks of carbohydrates are basically going to be some sugars that we'll describe below. There are monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. And so saccharides just basically means sugars, okay? And so if you look at what the prefix is, mono, di, or poly, from your med term, I'm sure you can figure it out already, right? So mono meaning one. Monosaccharides are a single sugar, like glucose, for example. And then disaccharides have two, two monomers, two sugars. And then polysaccharides are multiple sugars or greater than two monomers. So for example, glycogen is an example of this. Here are a few different ways to visually represent what the chemical structure of glucose is. 
you'll probably see all three of these images throughout the textbook. So you can see first on the left, A is showing you just a literally letter representation of what each of those different elements are. B is showing you the physical layout of how they would bond with one another in a schematic form. And then C is showing you a three-dimensional model of what it would look like. And this is basically all exactly the same thing. This is all glucose. So there are six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So remember that is the one to two to one ratio that we just discussed in the previous slide. So here is something really interesting. So you would think that the same chemical formula would mean that it's the exact same substance. But interestingly, that's not true. The arrangement physically of where the atoms bond changes everything, okay? It actually changes it into a totally different substance. So an isomer is something that has the same chemical formula, but a totally different arrangement of atoms. So that's kind of interesting. So examples of this are glucose and fructose. Now both are sugars, that's correct, but they are different types of sugars and they have a different arrangement. However, chemically, they are both C6H12O6, again, with that one to two to one ratio. And even cooler is that the liver can transform one into another, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And we'll discuss this more later on. Let's discuss lipids. It's 2-11 in your text. You're probably already familiar with various lipids in your life. So fats, oils, and waxes are things that we use every day and including in our cooking. Oils and waxes are differentiated by what their state is at room temperature. So oils are going to be liquid at room temperature, whereas waxes are going to be solid. All three of these, fats, oils, and waxes, are all insoluble in water. So they are all considered hydrophobic, right? So the five classes of lipids that we're going to discuss today are going to be fatty acids, icosanoids, glycerides, steroids, phospholipids, and glycolipids together. Now these are all very important in particular for reasons including energy storage. So we know that the adipose tissue in our bodies is a storage site of energy in times of famine when we don't have enough nutrition. Also it's a storage site and metabolism site for various hormones. It provides structure for our body as well. And also, this adipose tissue is going to provide insulation against temperature variation, as well as protection against physical assaults. Fatty acids. So what are fatty acids? Well, ultimately, they're just carbon chains that have hydrogen atoms attached, truly. Now, we're going to differentiate these based upon what happens in those carbon chains, right? So let's break it down a little bit. We have triglycerides and diglycerides. And these are telling you that in a triglyceride, we have three fatty acids attached to a glycerol versus in a diglyceride, we only have two fatty acids and a glycerol. So these are structural, sorry, structural delineations between the two. And they also can be either unsaturated or saturated. So an unsaturated fatty acid can be broken down into the following, either monounsaturated, meaning mono one, or polyunsaturated, poly meaning multiple, right? So in a monounsaturated fatty acid, you have one double bond. Whereas in a polyunsaturated fatty acid, you have two or more double bonds occurring. Now, both monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids are liquid at room temperature. So let's contrast this with saturated fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids have no double bonds and they have a single covalent bond only. Also, they're solid at room temperature. So this is interesting because saturated fats in general are solid at room temperature. So these are the sort of foods that we try to avoid for the most part because these are the types of foods that will basically create a situation in which we could have a greater atherosclerotic development or hardening of the arteries. So we'll discuss this more later on, but that is the application of deciding whether you're going to eat more saturated fats or more unsaturated fats. Icosanoids are only discussed very briefly in this chapter, but what you should know about them is that they're derived from arachidonic acid, and this cannot be something that is created by the body, so that means that we have to ingest it in our diet. So the two main groups of icosanoids that are discussed here are going to be leukotrienes and prostaglandins. So leukotrienes are produced by the immune system, and this has a large impact on our response to everything from encountering an infection to some sort of physical injury 
all the way up to including cancer. Prostaglandins are going to be considered local hormones. Now, hormones are beyond the scope of our discussion right now, but in general, hormones are a chemical messenger that is produced in one part of the body, but then it has an effect in a totally different part of the body. So prostaglandins are a little different in that they're considered local hormones, and I should put quotations around that because, like I said, hormones are supposed to affect a different part of the body. Prostaglandins will basically direct traffic of the cellular activity in a local area only. So prostaglandins are responsible for things like triggering labor contractions for a pregnant woman or stimulating nerve endings, and that actually triggers the sensation of pain. When we discuss glycerides, what we really focus on are triglycerides because they have a role in so many things. Um, triglycerides, of course, have a role in our cellular membrane structure and also in the adipose tissue that we carry in our bodies as well. So what are triglycerides? Well, first off, they have one glycerol and three fatty acid tails, and you can see some images of the structure over on the right. They're nonpolar, they're neutral fats, and they can be either saturated or unsaturated. They provide insulation to our bodies, it's a source of fuel, and also a source of protection. But most interestingly, in my opinion anyway, is that triglycerides are a storage source, and so they can hold on to all sorts of different chemicals that are lipid soluble, so vitamins, drugs, or toxins. All of these can be stored in triglycerides and held on to for quite a period of time. So for example, the positive end of this is that the triglycerides can hold on to vitamins that are lipid soluble. So vitamins A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble and therefore can be stored in triglycerides. Similarly, on the negative end of things, things such as DDT, which is a banned substance in the United States and Canada, however, is still used commonly in Central and South America for spraying fields, that can be stored in triglycerides and adipose tissue as well. So what that means is, if you were to consume an animal from a country that uses DDT broadly, you could imagine that DDT would compound in animals up the food chain. So if a field is sprayed with DDT and a bug gets sprayed with it or consumes food from a field that was sprayed with it, that bug gets eaten by a bird, the bird gets eaten by another animal, and as you proceed up the food chain and you eat an animal higher up the food chain, you are consuming effectively a lifetime's worth of exposure to DDT from all of the animals that that one animal that you ate, ate. So triglycerides are a really important storage site. Cholesterol has received a pretty bad rap in recent years, but it is not the worst thing in the world. As a matter of fact, it serves a very important function in our health. In fact, it serves several important functions. So first off, from a structural standpoint, it's an integral part of the plasma membrane. So that is the outer surface of our cells, and it helps to separate what is on the extracellular environment versus what can come into the intracellular environment. Secondly, it's the basis for synthesis of steroid hormones. So things like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, these are all sex-based hormones that have profound impacts on our body, ranging from the manifestation of sexual sec sorry, secondary sexual characteristics through to just the maintenance of our emotional well-being. Anybody who's taken a different birth control pill for a little while can certainly advocate for how having a different set of hormones in your body can totally change the way you feel about everything. This is all regulated by cholesterol. This slide is supplemental, but I want you to understand that while cholesterol has a lot of very important functions in the human body, it can become pathologic. So what you're looking at in the bottom is a series of cuts. They are sections through the left anterior descending artery in the heart, which is commonly known as the widowmaker because that is the site where very frequently atherosclerosis will occur because of hypercholesterolemia. So when somebody has elevated blood cholesterol or hypercholesterolemia, over time, the cholesterol can deposit on the inner lining of the arteries. And small arteries are the most susceptible to this effect. So the small arteries of the heart can easily be affected. And as soon as that fatty material that gets deposited narrows the lumen or the opening of the artery so much that it prevents blood from flowing through it, it's not just that blood doesn't get to that distal tissue, it's that oxygen also doesn't as well. So the tissue that is all distal to the blood supply at that point in the artery 
will die, and that is the functional basis of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. So phospholipids and glycolipids are both incredibly similar. So if you look at the image on the right, you're going to see what looks like a schematic of an, a headless person walking. So you see the two legs, and those legs are fatty acid chains. So on the left, the torso is composed of a phosphate group, whereas on the right, when you're looking at a glycolipid, a carbohydrate is placed in that same torso area. So these have an important structural role because they help us with our formation of plasma membranes in almost all of the cells in our body. And if you think about it, we need to have some sort of lipid barrier that's hydrophilic and hydrophobic at certain ends because that way we're able to keep fluid in our cells and not dehydrate and also not let everything permeate through water-based aqueous solutions into our cells. So phospholipids are really important in helping us maintain a barrier from our cells to the external environment outside of the cells. So in any of these phospholipids, you're going to see that there's a phosphate head, and that is charged and hydrophilic, and the two legs are the lipid tails, which are uncharged and hydro sorry, hydrophobic. Section 2-12 in your text is proteins. Let's go. Proteins are a whole lot more positive. They do a ton for us. So first, they help us with support in that it produces the scaffold by which we can build our bodies. Proteins are also responsible for our movement because they allow us to contract our muscles. It's responsible for transport in that the proteins will help us to bind certain substances so that way it can be transported through our blood system. So things ranging from lipids that are insoluble to gases and air exchange, those are all included as proteins. There are also enzymes that are responsible for metabolism. There are buffers that help prevent dangerous changes in our pH. So that's incredibly important. And then never mind that, then we get into hormones, which of course hormones have tremendous control over far ranging systems and metabolic activities as well. But I think the defense point is very interesting because you don't think of this necessarily right away, but the protein in your skin and your hair and your nails is a barrier. It's a waterproof barrier from our environment. Further, we also have antibodies that are produced and those are things that help us defend against various microorganisms. So the building blocks of proteins are amino acids, and all 20 of the amino acids are small, they're water-soluble molecules. So the average protein is going to have about 1,000 amino acids, and some are even as big as up to 100,000 or more. So the things that are included in proteins are going to be, sorry, that are included in amino acids are the following. You'll have a central carbon atom, a hydrogen atom, an amino group, a carboxyl group, and an R group. There are nine essential amino acids that are required in our diet because we cannot synthesize them ourselves. And these nine essential amines are also known as vitamins, right? They're vital amines. So let's discuss denaturation. And denaturation will basically make these proteins dysfunctional completely. So something like an egg. This is the best example of what is denaturing a protein. If you have an egg that has a whole bunch of protein in it that's raw, when you cook it and it becomes solid, you end up with a denatured set of proteins in that egg. So denaturation is really just breaking the hydrogen bonds, and then enzyme activity is going to deteriorate anything remaining. So the definition truly of denaturation is changing the structure by rendering the protein into a non-functional shape. So you remember before that we discussed how you can have isomers, which are structures that have the same molecular recipe, but it's in a different shape. Well, in this case, we're not changing any of the actual components of a molecule. We're just changing the shape so that it's now a no longer functional shape. So you can do this by either altering the pH or by high temperature or a couple other ways, but let's just focus on high temperature or altered pH for now. So this is my clinical correlation for you to understand why denaturation is important in the laboratory. So what you see above on the right is a formal and fixed brain. And you can see it looks like what you think a brain should look like, right? It's firm, it's intact, it's got the shape that you would expect. What you see on the bottom, that blob of a brain, that is actually a fresh brain that's been freshly removed from a human body. So it is not denatured yet. It has not been quote unquote formal and fixed.
or preserved in any way whatsoever. It is totally raw. And so fresh tissues can autolyze or putrefy, and those are just two different ways in which the tissue may basically break down. Autolyzing is breaking down through intrinsic enzymes in the tissue, whereas putrefication occurs because of extrinsic factors like bacteria, for example. So formalin, which is basically just formaldehyde in a slightly different formulation, it will denature the proteins so that way we can preserve the tissues indefinitely. So if you've ever seen any type of organ or body tissue in a jar of fluid that's been preserved in somebody's office or in a laboratory, what you're looking at is a tissue that has been fixed or denatured, and it's been sitting there for who knows how long. And typically formalin is the standard preservative that we use in the lab. So formalin in basically penetrates tissue very slowly. So large and fatty tissues will require sectioning or cutting to create slices, so that way there's more surface area for the formalin to penetrate into the tissue to firm it up. So the brain that you see on top on the right, that has been fixed. And there's a process which I won't bother explaining now, but if you're interested, email me and I'll tell you all about it. But anyway, that brain has been fixed over a period of probably two or three weeks, suspended floating in a bath of formalin, so that way it could maintain its shape. Otherwise, the weight of the gravity, sorry, the gravitational effect on the weight of the brain will create this blob that you see below, and that's not very good for seeing any anatomical structures. The sequence of amino acids will determine the shape of a protein, and then that shape subsequently will determine the function. So it goes in that order. The amino acids create the shape, the shape creates the function, okay? So fibrous proteins are responsible for things throughout the body because they are tough and durable, and they're insoluble in water. They're usually due to secondary or quaternary structure proteins. By contrast, with like globular proteins, these are much more functional because they're more compact, and like the word globular, like a globe, they're more rounded and they're soluble in water. So a lot of the enzymes, hormones, and other molecules that are in our bloodstream are they're going to be globular proteins. So let's discuss how these amino acid chains that fold that create the structure that makes them either fibrous or globular proteins. Protein structure is based on four characteristics, the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And this just really means first, second, third, and fourth, okay? Pretty straightforward. So the primary structure is strictly just the sequence of amino acids on a single polypeptide. That's it. It's just the order in which they are present. Now the secondary structure gets a little bit more complicated because this is the shape that results because of hydrogen bonds. And so it will create one of two things. It will either create an alpha helix, which will create a simple spiral, or it can create a beta sheet, which is basically a flat pleated sheet. And remember, by the way, the shape is responsible for determining the function. Tertiary protein structure is created by the structure folding and coiling upon itself, and that results in the final three-dimensional shape. So much like the way that a fetus or an embryo in utero has various components that will bend and fold and then separate, the same thing happens with proteins at this level, at the tertiary level. And so it results primarily from hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions as this proceeds. Quaternary protein structure, or the fourth step in protein structure, is relating to the interaction between different individual polypeptide chains as they interact together. And so this results in structures like collagen, hemoglobin, and keratin, which are present throughout our bodies and have wide-ranging functions. Nucleic acids are 2-13 in your text. All right, everybody, we are almost there. Let's talk about nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are essentially just a couple long chains of repeating subunits of nucleotides. And a nucleotide has three distinct parts. A pentose, which is a five carbon sugar, think of a pentagram or a pentagon, it has five sides, right? So it has five carbons in the sugar. That's attached to a phosphate group and also a nitrogenous base. So the pentose is either going to be ribose and RNA, so the two R's there, right? Or deoxyribose, sorry, deoxyribose in DNA. The two D's go together there, right? So in DNA, we're going to have adenine, thymine, 
sorry, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Whereas an RNA replacing thymine. So thymine will be replaced with uracil. So you'll have adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Full disclosure. I went to Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science for my graduate training, and I taught there as a professor for several years prior to coming to ICC. So if you've ever read about Rosalind Franklin, you would know that she's been broadly credited for discovering the structure of DNA prior to Watson and Crick wandering down the hall and looking at her notes. She was kind of an unsung hero. So anyway, I'm a little bit of a dork about DNA, but let's discuss a little bit about it. So what does DNA do? Well, it functions to control all cellular processes, so it's kind of the brain of the cell if you want to think of it that way. It is in the nucleus of our cells and it codes for proteins, and what it will do is it will take that code and be able to put it into new cells, into new generations of cells or other organisms. So the shape you've seen a million times is a double helix conformation, and a double helix is probably best exemplified as if you can imagine taking a ladder and twisting it, or like a spiral staircase. That's the classic DNA configuration. And again, we have those four main building blocks. In DNA, we have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. This image here shows you how DNA at the top in the double helix formation will be transcribed and then changed into RNA and then translated into proteins. So the function of RNA is basically to take copies of that DNA code and it brings it from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, so from the center of the cell out to the periphery, so that way protein synthesis can occur. The shape of RNA is a single strand, but it can fold upon itself, and the building blocks of RNA are a little different than the building blocks in DNA. So remember that while the adenine, cytosine, and guanine are the same in both RNA and DNA, in RNA, the thymine is replaced with uracil. ATP, it's section 2-14 in your text. All right, we're almost there. ATP, let's talk about this for a moment. If you're really interested in physical fitness, you've probably read a fair bit about ATP already because it is the energy currency of cells. Uh, we call this a high energy compound, which is really just a covalent bond that when it breaks down releases energy that the cell can use. And so the product that has this bond is a high energy compound. And it's formed by phosphorylation of an adenine nucleotide in which there are three phosphates. So let's discuss these three phosphates. So we start off with adenine monophosphate or AMP and that already has one phosphate group, right? Mono meaning one. And then what ends up happening is we'll change that and attach a second phosphate group, which creates adenosine diphosphate, remember di meaning two. It takes a considerable amount of energy to convert AMP, the mono, to the di, to ADP. And so the second phosphate is attached by a high energy bond. It takes yet even further energy to add a third phosphate to create the high energy compound ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. So ADP to ATP is going to be responsible for storing energy, whereas when we break down ATP to ADP after ATP has already been formed, that releases energy. So the energy currency is effectively the result of the breakdown of ATP. And ATP is formed from AMP, which becomes ADP, which then becomes ATP. All right. That's it guys, you're doing great. Let's get into a couple questions here to see how you've learned everything so far. If you take two or more atoms and combine them chemically, this forms an A molecule, B ion, or C mixture. Well, you remember that an ion is going to be something that is charged. A mixture might be several things combined together and a molecule is going to be two or more atoms chemically combined. This question is different from the previous because it's not asking you what two or more atoms that are chemically combined are, it's asking you what two or more different atoms that are chemically combined are. So we know from the previous question that the correct answer was molecule and that was two or more atoms chemically combined. In this case, it's two or more different atoms that are chemically combined. So we know it's not just a molecule, 
And we already ruled out ion and mixture. So B is the correct answer, compound. This question is asking you to differentiate between the building blocks of the different organic compounds. So first off, we can rule out D and E because amino acids and nucleotides we know for sure are part of nucleic acids, right? And we know that glycerol and fatty acids and glycerol fatty acids in a phosphate group, those are all not carbohydrates. Whereas we know that carbohydrates are formed by sugars, right? So as soon as you see that saccharides, that should be a really quick tip that you're looking at a carbohydrate. So the correct answer is C, monosaccharides. Anybody who's a long distance runner or any endurance athlete will probably know the answer to this right away. The main function of which molecule is to provide quick energy? And the answer is A, carbohydrates. Which of these molecules is both hydrophobic and hydrophilic and is the primary component of plasma membranes. So there are two answers here that are involved heavily in plasma membranes, and those are triglycerides and phospholipids. Now, while the triglycerides have an important role in the plasma membrane, they're not responsible for maintaining that barrier in the way that the phospholipids are. So phospholipids, by far and above, have a considerably more important role in maintaining plasma membranes. So the answer is B, phospholipid. This question gives you a little bit of a hint because it's asking you which molecule is held together by large numbers of hydrogen bonds, but it also hints the two sides of this long twisted molecule. So the long twisted molecule that comes to mind for all of you should immediately be DNA, the spiral helix or the twisted staircase. So we know for sure right away that the correct answer is D, DNA. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. I know that it is so hard to sit and watch your computer screen for this long. It's hard enough to sit in a lecture, never mind when you're just sitting by yourself in your office or wherever you are. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you. I do appreciate it, and I really wish I could see your faces, because then that way I would know if you were confused and maybe needed another example, or if what I was saying made perfect sense and you wanted me to hurry up and move on to the next topic because you already understood it from before. So anyway, I just want to let you know I am here. Please do reach out to me, email me if you have any questions, and if we have to have a more complicated conversation, we can Zoom. I will help you out. I want to make sure you get this stuff. So please take your time, focus on all this information when you study, read it over many times, and then further, make sure when you study for the mastering anatomy and physiology quizzes that you really feel ready to take them because the exam is going to be more complicated than the quizzes. The quizzes are almost kind of a learning experience, so it's a really nice opportunity for you to build up some points for the class. But prepare for the exams to be very challenging. So if you have any questions again, please contact me. That's all the time of yours I'll take up. Thank you so much, and I hope you are all staying healthy and well, and your loved ones are all healthy and well too. Okay, bye.